Chris, that Ferrari Enzo was nearly obliterated in the high-speed crash along the PCH. The occupants who were protected inside its Formula One-styled cockpit walked away. I think that the Gizmondo, with all its features in one place, or in one machine, has a position for the consumers. With such a name, sticky balls could make you smile. But one of those men, Stefan Eriksson, isn't escaping attention. Imagine the year 2005, before smartphones, back when most people still used dial-up internet, and when the most common form of GPS was a TomTom -tom mountain in a car here and there. This was when the cutting edge of handheld video games were the Nintendo DS and Sony PSP. And here comes a new player, a game system from an unknown company who's never made a video game system before, and it's set to do everything. It's a GPS. It's an MP3 player. It runs Windows. You can text with it. It's sleek. It's portable. It force speeds you ads. It melts in direct sunlight. It's connected to a mafia group. It's partially created by a carpet company in Florida, but it's actually British, but it's actually Swedish. It's the worst selling video game console of all time, and it came and went in less than a year. This is the life and death of the Tiger Telematics Gizmondo. This is Carl Johan Freer. According to his personal blog, he is a Swedish businessman and technology entrepreneur, primarily known for founding the American electronics company Tiger Telematics, which manufactured the handheld game console Gizmondo, which itself raises the question, how was Tiger Telematics founded? That's not so straightforward, actually. And Fear himself is not such a straightforward person. And over the years, he has been arrested numerous times in countries ranging from Sweden to Spain to the US. When Freer was 18, he was arrested for the first time. His crime? Forging his father's name on a loan. In the years leading up to the year 2000, he accrued thousands of dollars in tax debts, was part of 14 different company bankruptcies, and often refused to operate under his own name, notably conducting business in Germany under the alias of Eric Johnson. But in 2000, it seemed Freer was beginning on a new path in life, one involved in the ever-growing world of consumer electronics. Based in Freer's native Sweden, this was a small electronics distributor called Eagle Eye Scandinavian. And initially, Eagle Eye didn't make much of a splash. I mean, why would they? They were just a simple distributor. But they clearly grew very quickly. Freer had larger ambitions. He originally wanted to create a device for keeping tabs on children while they were out and about away from their parents. According to a later interview with Eurogamer, Do you remember the Soa murders? Terrible. We were all parents and we were talking about the issues around that. We started looking at doing a child tracker, so we thought, how about we make it more fun? What if we put in a gaming interface? In 2001, Eagle Eye expanded to the UK, formally beginning operations on October 9th. Things would get even odder the next year. In 2002, Eagle Eye would merge with Floor Decor, a carpet retailer based out of Florida. They would then rebrand globally as Tiger Telematics and prepare to go public. It was at this point that several people would formally join Freer at Tiger, and the company hierarchy would be cemented. Along with being founder, Freer would also be chairman of their board of directors. Joining him as CFO would be Michael Carinder, the former head of Floor Decor, and rounding off the team in a directorial role was the most mysterious of the three, Stefan Eriksson. To say Ericsson had lived a wild life would be to put it lightly. Ericsson, prior to joining Tiger, had been the head of the Uppsala Mafia, a criminal organization known for some of the highest profile crimes ever committed in Sweden. Eriksson, 
dömdes idag har anknytning till flera grova bedrägerier. Stefan Eriksson, who early on was nicknamed Fat Staff, was not a traditional violent criminal. His childhood had been free of trouble, he was quite diligent at school, did not abuse drugs, and only made his criminal debut at the age of 19 with a series of burglaries together with an older relative. In the personal investigation conducted at the time, in 1981, Erickson was described as sensitive, even wet. He had also done his job as a car body repairer perfectly. The fact that he had armed himself with a revolver, however, indicated that there were sides to him that those around him had not seen. Arm stealing, drug smuggling, even once shoved a gun in a man's mouth and threatened to cut off his fingers. Through the 1980s and 90s, Erickson was arrested multiple times and he developed a reputation. He was known for driving expensive cars and flaunting his wealth wherever he could, cultivating the image of a playboy. He was particularly fond of showing off his race boat, the Snow White, often docked in downtown Uppsala. Perhaps Erickson's highest profile case came at the turn of the 1990s, where his group attempted to defraud a bank of nearly 22 million Swedish kroner, the equivalent of 2.7 million US dollars at the time. While Erickson was found guilty of fraud and counterfeiting and received a decade-long prison sentence, the Swedish police struggled to find anyone willing to testify against him. The head witness would later be a victim of two different bomb attacks. And yet, Erickson would not serve his full sentence, and would be let out in just around five years. He'd leave Sweden at that time to head to London, where he'd meet Carl Freer. Despite all of the controversy lurking in the background, Tiger Telematics did have legitimate product in the works, thanks in part to their new subsidiary, GameTrack Europe. Or rather, thanks in part to GameTrack working alongside a UK-based tech firm, PlexTech. In early 2003, GameTrack and PlexTech started developing a secretive new project together called in the early stages, the GameTrack Advance. Though this name is very reminiscent of Nintendo's Game Boy Advance, which was the biggest portable game system on the market at the time, the GameTrack console was meant to be so much more than just another way to play video games. It had a camera. It was an MP3 player. It could take standard MMC flashcards. It had the TV tuner. It could take a SIM card. It was even going to have built-in GPS features straight from launch. These were all things promised by Tiger in their first official press release, coming out in September 2003. In a world still nearly four years away from the first iPhone, this all had the potential to be revolutionary, and already it was planned to be so much more than what eventually became the Gizmondo. The game track was announced as an entire line of compatible products, a line Tiger assured was more than doable. Early on, the game track resembled a small yellow pager, matching the colors used in a set of promotional images where it was announced that Tiger would be the official sponsor of the Eddie Jordan Grand Prix team starting in 2003. Later on, the system would take more of a rounded shape, nicknamed by some as the Bean. While it originally featured a fully metal housing, this would later give way to a smooth plastic finish. Ian Murphy, technical director at PlexTech, would say in the original press release for the game track system, Our firm's track record clearly indicates our ability to provide Tiger the new design features that they have envisioned. People would truly begin to take notice of the game track system when it appeared at CES in Las Vegas in 2004. Here it was sporting a new name, the Gizmondo, and it was not being shown off by Tiger themselves, but rather by Microsoft. Microsoft by this point already had a home game console of their own, the original Xbox. But this wasn't the first time they'd supported another company's game system. Back in 1999, Sega had released their final game console in North America, the Dreamcast. Empowering this system was a version of Microsoft's Windows CE operating system, a version of which would also be featured on the Gizmondo. Uh, Windows CE for its operating system, mm -hmm. and uh, it's got an NVIDIA graphics accelerator. Uh, it's called the GoForce 4500, and it packs between one and two megabytes ooh, <laughs> of 
video ran on that thing. It was hoped the Microsoft push would help build hype. With a release date ultimately set for early 2005, Tiger and GameTrack wanted the Gizmodo to be the start of something big, but they would not be the first. Back in 2003, Finnish tech giant Nokia had released their own portable game console that promised to revolutionize mobile tech, the Nokia N-Gage. Featuring ports of PlayStation and Game Boy Advance titles along with its own unique games, the N-Gage hoped to offer a gaming experience on par with the Game Boy Advance, yet the functionality of the best cell phones on the market. And overwhelmingly, critics and consumers alike considered it capable of doing neither well. The system was clunky and cumbersome to play games on, with cell phone style buttons having to be used for game controls. It was also awkward to swap cartridges, with changing games requiring removing the system's battery. It was also useless as a standalone game console, with the N-Gage refusing to boot without a SIM card inserted. And it became a source of early memes due to its microphone being located in a rather awkward place, earning it the nickname of the Taco Phone. But Nokia would not be the first or last to try combining a handheld game system with a phone or PDA. Back in the 1990s, Tiger Electronics, a company with no relation to Tiger Telematics, released the GameCom, a game system with a touchscreen and basic web features that was considered by many to be barely usable. And in 2001, American phone and PDA maker Palm would create a subsidiary called Tapwave, releasing a Palm OS-based system in 2003 called the Zodiac. Yet despite their best efforts, they just could not compete with Nintendo's dominance in the handheld space and bowed out completely when Sony released a PlayStation Portable in 2005. But the Gizmondo was supposed to be something different. They had Microsoft on their side, they had cutting edge technology, and they were creating the system with the UK market in mind, despite a global release being planned. Tell us a little bit more about the Gizmondo itself. Gizmondo is based in the UK, and they're releasing a gaming device that does a lot of multimedia capabilities, video, audio, GPS navigation, GPRS for text messaging, and of course, great 3D gaming, powered by the NVIDIA chip. Do you know the current title list that's out at the moment? They've got a launch title list of around six to eight titles. Actually, they've recently purchased a game developer called Warthog out of the UK, and they're developing a lot of titles, including Richard Burns Rally, one of their popular games for PlayStation 2. There were even plans for specialized versions of the system. One was dedicated to gambling, one went all in on being a dedicated GPS, and one mock-up called the Gizmondo Isis was perhaps better named the Gizmondo for her. Of these three, none ever came to market. At the very least, it seemed like the base Gizmodo had the potential to maybe carve out its own niche. 400 megahertz processor together with a 64-bit graphics accelerator makes the games in this machine very, very good. First of all, uh, it's a multi-entertainer and it's handheld and it's very powerful. And this enables us to add a lot of different functions to the device. That means that you can play games on it, you can listen to music, you can watch movies. They can be stored on the SD card, which is external. Uh, the memory can get up to one gigabyte in memory. Despite a lot of the features inside being new for the time, this being Tiger's first system and a development schedule being rather tight, a lot involved with the project were really passionate about what the Gizmondo could be. In the words of GameTrack technical director Steve Carroll, we needed every speed, cost, and risk avoidance strategy available to meet an incredibly challenging development schedule. CES 2004 can be seen as the start of an entire marketing blitz for the Gizmondo. Tiger's higher-ups wanted more than just a formal announcement and advertising campaign. They wanted something more spectacular. In April 2004, GameTrack, the company, would be renamed to Gizmondo Europe due to a naming dispute in the UK. Compared with what was to come, things would start off comparatively small, with magazine ads running featuring Formula One drivers. Even huge convention showings were done, notably at E3 2004, where journalists got to try the system hands-on. Over 65,000 industry professionals from 87 different countries descended on Los Angeles for four days that June, the perfect place to promote a new handheld. 
At this point in development, the flashcards have been swapped for proper SD cards, and games have been announced including several from Electronic Arts, such as FIFA Soccer 2005 and SSX3, and journalists were clearly impressed. According to IGN writer Adam Tierney, What's so strong about the system is that each feature is incorporated into every aspect of the system, for a fully integrated approach where everything you can do as a separate application can be done during gameplay too. At a projected price of 250 UK pounds, roughly $350 US, the GIS model is not on the cheap end of the spectrum. However, if the system delivers on all of its promises, it could be the ideal wireless for a media center. The system itself is a solid little device, much smaller than the original GBA and comparable to the Nokia's N-Gage. It should be mentioned, this was not the final price tag. In fact, the Gizmondo would be split into two different models later that year. And this is where cracks really begin to show with the Gizmondo. In 2004, there were two major handheld games consoles in the market. Nintendo's Game Boy Advance was four years old and had several different models. The most popular, the folding Game Boy Advance SP, could be bought for just under 100 US dollars. The same year, Nintendo released their follow-up to the Game Boy Advance. The Nintendo DS was not only backwards compatible with GBA titles, but only retailed for $50 more. That's not to mention the PlayStation Portable from Sony, which would retail for $250 upon release in 2005. And that was considered rather pricey for the time, despite being leaps and bounds more powerful than even the DS. The Gizmondo would be farther expensive still. In late 2004, it was announced that, at launch, the Gizmondo would cost an eye-watering $400. This was similar in price to the Xbox 360, a proper home video game console that would also launch in 2005. There is backlash, there is concern, and there is even questioning if the people at Tiger Telematics knew what they were doing at all. In the run-up to the launch of the Gizmondo, Tiger's main revenue streams came from outside of gaming, actually, namely just under £100,000 from a subsidiary called Isis Models, a modeling agency that Tiger acquired. But development and promotion of the Gizmondo continued on unfettered. Tiger had acquired several game studios to produce new games, and what were supposed to be the beginnings of a full-blown hype machine were kicking into full swing especially in the UK. Gizmondo launches in the UK and store allocation units run out, although no one said exactly how many that was. As Sony has already announced a European delay in the launch of its PSP handheld, hinting at a June release, Gizmondo was quick to apply for the post of Nintendo's European nemesis. In order to prove its status in the market, Gizmondo Europe invited a host of well-known music stars to participate in the UK launch. Since a music service for the handheld is already in place, the presence of well-known artists is understandable. On Saturday, March 19th, London's Regent Street came to a near standstill as over 2,000 fans swarmed the store to see Pharrell Williams, Danny Minogue, Vern Troyer, Buster Rhymes, and Lennox Lewis pop by the shop on its opening day and to get their hands on the first Gizmondos. The store's allocation of units was completely gone before the doors were finally shut again at 6pm to prepare for the evening event. This is the story of the Bumblebee. Its wings are too small and its body too big. According to all principles, it's too heavy for its wings. It just can't fly. But no one has told this to the Bumblebee. So it flies and flies. He doesn't care much about principles, do you? This was the pre-launch party for the Gizmondo. While an initial batch of quickly sold out systems could be bought from Gizmondo's official store in London, the system itself wouldn't actually launch across the UK until April 22nd. 
and it certainly raised some eyebrows in the gaming press. By talking to people outside of the games industry, I got the distinct impression that Gizmondo had spent so much time telling everyone in the industry that they forgot to tell anyone else. And that anyone else includes the all-important end user, you. So what happened on launch day? Well, Gizmondo opened up a store in Regent Street, London, and had a huge bash with celebs popping out of the woodwork all over the place at a reported cost of £800,000. At £229 a pop, it didn't take a genius to figure out that the Gizmondo would need to shift roughly 3,500 units in a fairly short space of time to break even on their opening bash. So how many units did they reportedly have for sale on opening day? Erm, um, thousand. Yep, even though they managed to sell all 1,000 units in about 4 hours, the money they made wouldn't have even covered Jamiroquai's JK's fees for showing his face at the bash. I think that the Gizmondo, with all its features in one place, or in one machine, has a position for the consumers. I think it would be a very interesting battle between us, Sony, Nintendo, Nokia, and maybe some others. Um, but I think that uh, we will turn out well. The March pre-release was a huge spectacle. However, calling the April rollout a nationwide launch is perhaps being generous. Indeed, despite the hype leading up to launch, the Gizmodos seemed to crawl off the starting line. Before release, Tiger dropped the launch price of the Gizmodo from £300, nearly £400 USD, to £229, close to £300 USD. A significant drop, sure, but still the price of three Game Boy Advances put together. But Tiger had other plans for another, cheaper Gizmondo. This version was called the Smart Ads Gizmondo, and cost only £129, around US$170. US dollars. The catch? Throughout the day, at random, Tiger could make your system pause whatever you were doing, even mid-game, and force you to watch up to three advertisements. This was seen as completely unpalatable by many. Journalist Tony Smith from The Register would say of the Smart Ads Gizmondo, Crucially, the service is not available on any other device, which we'd say is good news for the customers of Sony, Nintendo, Tapwave, et al. So what you're saying is this, it, the, the whole purpose of this, this is a new, basically, handheld, this, they're tr trying to compete with, like, the PSP or the, the DS. Well, that's unclear. You know, it's, when you ask them, they'll say that it's, it's actually more of a mobile gaming device. It's a convergence device, you know, because um, this actually has a mobile data capability, so it communicates uh, over a cell phone network, uh, which is something that the DS and the PSP can't do. This and is true. Instead of driving more people to buy the other, more expensive Gizmondo model, most consumers just opted for other forms of entertainment altogether. Even at the pre-release, despite Gizmondo's execs bragging about the thousand units sold on day one at the Regent Street store, they had originally hoped to have been able to sell over 4,500. That summer, the Gizmondo would launch in Sweden, with an American launch coming that October. Smart ads were never enabled in any of these regions. Perhaps doubly damning was an announcement made in September, one month before the American launch. Tiger was developing a more powerful widescreen Gizmondo. According to Wikipedia, the Osborne effect is a social phenomenon of customers canceling or deferring orders for the current, soon-to-be obsolete product as an unexpected drawback of a company's announcing a future product prematurely. It is an example of cannibalization. The term alludes to the Osborne Computer Corporation, whose second product did not become available until more than a year after it was announced. The company's subsequent bankruptcy was widely blamed on reduced sales after the announcement. This alone may have pushed a lot of potential customers to wait off for this more powerful system that was, at most, a couple of years away. It never saw release. Tiger also didn't seem to understand the proper channels to sell their system through. Along with being able to be bought online through Tiger, in the UK, systems were mostly sold through high street retailers and Gizmondo's own store, but not through any dedicated game shops. And perhaps bizarrely in North America, despite plans to sell through stores such as Target and GameStop, the system could only exclusively be bought from 38 dedicated mall kiosks scattered around the US. According to Freyer, this was down to a combination of financing and manufacturing problems. The Gizmondo was comprised of over 260 components, he says many of which had long lead times. Tiger also seemed to have an issue of sustained advertising after launch. 
Though they had an entire slate of commercials and print ads produced, these had a seemingly odd rollout. One print ad in particular was planned to appear in Nintendo Power Magazine, the official publication of Tiger's main competitor. The Gizmondo also had a game library problem, especially at launch. When the Gizmondo first hit shelves in the UK, there was only one singular title available, Trailblazer. This was a remake of a game originally for the Commodore 64 computer, released 20 years prior. This number would then be amped up to 8 titles for the US release, though this was out of a total of 14 ever released games for the system worldwide. And while there were a few third-party games, such as the previously mentioned offerings from EA, there was one title that gained infamy above all the others. It was one that was at times bundled with the system, and that was often referred to as the system seller. This was Sticky Balls. Sticky Balls was developed in-house by Gizmondo Studio in Manchester. It's a puzzle game involving elements of billiards where players shoot balls into one another to try to stick them together. Originally in development by Studio Z2 for pocket PC devices, they were later bought out by a larger studio who shifted development to the PSP. And then, that studio was bought out by Tiger, who shifted it to the Gizmondo. It actually got mostly favorable reviews. With such a name, Sticky Balls could make you smile, especially in France. Bulls sticantes. As long as we have the wrong mind. But no, Sticky Balls has nothing dirty. On the contrary, it's a good-natured, amusing, and very colorful game. But in the world of the early 2000s internet, none of that seemed to matter because the game had a goofy, dirty name and a catchy song. In retrospective looks, it's often said that Sticky Balls itself outlived the Gizmondo. In the summer of 2005, the Gizmondo had once again appeared E3. And this time, there was a larger presence, more attempts to woo the press, and yet an overall much more lukewarm reception than the year prior. Levi Buchanan from games news outlet IGN would say of the system at E3 2005, To be fair, not many people knew if the original Game Boy or the iPod would take off like they did. Both are now de facto brands in portable entertainment. However, let's be honest here. The Gizmondo is not going to attain the heights of those two portables. For one thing, those devices chose one specific function and did it with laser focus. The Game Boy played great games and still does. The iPod was a smart music player with a brilliant storefront. The Gizmondo's effectiveness is watered down by trying to do too many things, and some of the features suffer as a result, such as camera and video playback. Tiger might have been better off just choosing a short list of functions and pursuing excellence with them. A solid game player with an onboard GPS? You have my interest there, without a doubt. But an MP3 player without onboard drive space? A low-res camera? Suddenly, I'm starting to doubt the feature of convergence again. Another, more damning review of the system was given by Guy Cocker of CNET. He said, We may as well get the comparisons out of the way. The Tiger Telematics Gizmondo doesn't come close to touching the Sony PlayStation Portable. and won't even challenge the Nintendo DS for second place. In hardware terms, it looks three years too late, sitting next to the old Game Boy Advance as something you'd be embarrassed to use in public. Perhaps this was an omen for the Gizmondo as a whole. At one point, 30 different titles were in production for Tiger's handheld. These include both new original games and entries into long-running series, including a version of Microsoft's Halo but the vast majority of them would be cancelled. One such cancelled title was Hit and Myth, a 3D shoot-'em-up. Despite being ready to ship, the game would face cancellation at the last minute due to issues on Tiger's end. According to Anthony Salter, a programmer who worked on Hit and Myth, We initially used Xforge from Fathammer for various things like copy protecting the SD card and other utilities until the last minute when it turned out Gizmondo Corporate hadn't paid for the Xforge license and wasn't going to. So we had to strip it all out and rewrite those features ourselves, which was a pain. 
There were a couple of times when our payments were delayed and it became clear that the company was in trouble. Our studio lead did a great job of shielding us from these problems by budgeting well and having an emergency fund to pay us out of. Development probably took about nine months to a year or so. I came onto the project when it was about one third finished. Salter would also write up his experience working on this game on his personal blog. He would say in one post, The then CEO of Gizmondo had always seemed kind of fishy, but then a newspaper article came out in Europe that accused him and some of the other Gizmondo investors of having ties to the Mafia of all things. The CEO eventually resigned and left a huge mess in his wake. Hidden Myth went gold in late October, but Gizmondo didn't have the necessary cash to publish it. In October 2005, several of Tiger's executives would quit. Swedish criminal ties would surface, along with the news of Tiger having lost nearly 100 million US dollars. Carl Freer and Stefan Eriksson tendered their resignations on the 20th of October, a document filed with the US Securities and Exchange Commission's SEC revealed this week. Freer co-founded Gizmondo Europe and was the company's managing director. He was also a chairman of the parent company, Tiger Telematics. The resignations came a month after Tiger posted its long-awaited FY 2004 full-year financial performance report. The document, filed with the SEC as Tiger announced a plan to trade its stock on NASDAQ, revealed not only a massive $99.2 million loss, unsurprising, perhaps given the cost of developing the Gizmondo handheld, but also some very generous executive compensation packages provided in the form of cash, loans, automobile allowances, and stock. To make matters worse, this week's Swedish language newspaper Oftenblada reported that Ericsson and Uff both received criminal convictions in the mid-1990s. A Gizmondo Europe spokesman confirmed to the Register today that Ericsson and Uff had quit the company when their past, which they had not previously disclosed to the company, he claimed, came to light as a result of Oftenblada's probe. Ericsson and Freer were not quietly retiring. Indeed, they would make their way to California, where they would live a rather lavish lifestyle. Back at Tiger, despite 30 million US dollars initially being pledged for advertising in the US, little seemed to truly materialize from these campaigns, little at least that would change Gizmondo's fortunes. Part of this was eaten up by lawsuits. Jordan Grand Prix would settle an ongoing suit against Tiger in September 2005, filed due to Tiger not having paid out their promised sponsorship money. That same year, a lawsuit would come from MTV, who famously broadcasted the star-studded London launch party back in March, for Gizmondo backing out of an agreement to sponsor several shows. One would come from Ogilvy, an advertising partner, for unpaid marketing work and materials. Not to mention, but back in July 2005, Gizmondo was sued by the University of Texas Board of Regents for infringing a patent of theirs, the Gizmondo's predictive text functionality. Though there had been that $30 million originally set aside for marketing in the US, it's safe to say that a lot of that was probably eaten up by the time it actually launched. Tiger would miss paying a lot of its associated employees in December 2005. Salter would recall the experience, saying, And then in December, we didn't get paid. It made for a lackluster Christmas. Despite rumors that a new, improved Gizmondo would be on the way as soon as 2006, no new Gizmondo games would come after the 22nd of October 2005, the same day as the North American release of the system itself. On the 23rd of January 2006, Gizmondo Europe would officially announce bankruptcy. Despite the glitz and glamour and the hype leading up to the Gizmondo's launch, the cost of it all and the failure of the system itself would lead to a final, total loss of over 300 million US dollars. Liquidators would be appointed in the UK that February, with the Gizmondo officially announced dead on February 16th. The final nail would come with the closure of the Gizmondo store on Regent Street on April 16th. With a lifespan of just around 11 months and fewer than 25,000 units sold, the Gizmondo would earn the record of being the worst-selling video game system of all time. The Ferrari hurdles down the dead straight road, spins around and skits sideways toward a utility pole. The pole splits the sports car into two parts, sheet metal, engine, and wheels fly through the air. The forehand twists and turns until it stands still. Los Angeles Police Department examination of the February 21st accident suggests that no human can survive such a crash. 
And yet, the $1 million Ferrari Enzo was worth its money. Its owner, 44-year-old Swede Stefan Eriksson, emerged almost unharmed from the debris of the carbon-reinforced passenger compartment on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. When most people who do know of the Gizmondo think about it, they perhaps don't think of the system itself, but rather this event right here. The result of racing a one-of-a-kind supercar down a public roadway at just under 320 kilometers an hour, all while under the influence. At the scene of yesterday's crash, sheriff's investigators talked to Stefan Erickson, who said he was the owner of the smashed million-dollar Ferrari. Well, maybe. Erickson resigned from Gizmondo in October after a Swedish newspaper claimed he was known as Fat Steffi and was convicted in Sweden in the 1990s for involvement with Sweden's Uppsala Mafia. A million-dollar Ferrari is a pile of junk tonight that crashed on Pacific Coast Highway today going at least 120 miles an hour. Sheriff Sergeant Philip Brooks told ABC News that he received a call from the Bank of Scotland claiming that the bank was in the process of repossessing the car and that Erickson owns a second Ferrari Enzo with a questionable registration. As for the Ferrari, it's apparently owned by the Bank of Scotland. They actually received a call from the Bank of Scotland, and they said that they had repossessed the, far, or the uh, Ferrari uh, based on fraudulent loans uh, when it was initially financed. And yet, it seems that a one-of-a-kind Ferrari crashed in a street race was about to be the least of Ericsson's worries. Here are some facts Fox 11 has learned about Stefan Ericsson. The 44-year-old is considered an accomplished Ferrari driver once racing a Ferrari Modena sponsored by Gizmondo. That's a handheld video game you almost heard about. Ericsson was one of Gizmondo's top execs. Last fall, the company hit money problems before it could fully get into the video game race. And the internet is filled with reports of Ericsson's resignation under a cloud of financial controversy. Court-appointed liquidators are combing through thousands of pages of documents, but no one seems to know where all the money went or how Ericsson and Freer transplanted their personal wealth and reinvented themselves in California. Financial investigators are examining why investors and Gizmodo's parent company, Tiger Telematics Inc. of Jacksonville, were not aware that Ericsson was a felon. Well, now controversy has tailed Mr. Ericsson to Malibu. He told investigators he wasn't driving the Red Enzo, but he can't provide a full name of the man he says was at the wheel. Why was he racing that Ferrari? And where did the money go? Ericsson was officially arrested for failing to make payments on three sports cars that were imported to the U.S. from Britain. Other charges may be added pending DNA tests and further investigation, including DUI and fraud for the business venture that the three sports cars were purchased on. He is also being held without bail because of his questionable visa status. Arraignment on this case is expected to begin this week. Ericsson eventually claimed a man named Dietrich was driving the car, not him. Though, this man was never found. Within a few weeks, a local entrepreneur was marking a t-shirt with an image of the demolished Ferrari on the front and Dietrich on the back. Car enthusiasts scoured the crash site for souvenirs, one even sold scraps on eBay. Meanwhile, the authority through the story was going to get even bigger. The case was spinning off in directions so varied and bizarre, it was all they could do to follow the latest developments. Now there's a gun, a yacht, and maybe a connection to Homeland Security. Tony Valdez joins us now with more. Phil, we already know about the million dollar Ferrari, but now there's a $14 million yacht that could be involved, along with multi-million dollar international investments. And that story about the Ferrari racing with a Mercedes on PCH, it appears to be the biggest zero of all. The man claiming to be the passenger, Stefan Erickson, told investigators he was a deputy commissioner with the San Gabriel Valley Transit Authority's anti-terrorism unit. He even presented them with a card. There it is. According to an uh, internet report, he's involved in the Swedish Mafia. And this man, identified only as Trevor, told investigators that he was a passenger in a Mercedes that was racing the Ferrari. Two people who were known to Ericsson and Trevor have added a new facet to the case. Associates of Ericsson uh, appeared at the crash scene flashing badges saying they were Homeland Security. Those same men took Ericsson and Trevor home from the crash. Home for Trevor was supposed to be a $14 million yacht in a slip at Marina del Rey. That boat is no longer in the slip, but as it was last seen out in the bay. There's one more intriguing tidbit about Trevor, who apparently asked a passerby at the crash site if he could sit in the man's car and use his cell phone. Uh, a little later, the owner of that car called us and said he found a clock magazine stuffed under the driver's seat of his car. The magazine, fully loaded with bullets, 
As for those men who were flashing the Homeland Security badges, deputies don't know whether they were real or not. That could be an important part of this story. Now, investigators say they're filling a lot of leads about the race and about Erickson. The Sheriff's Department says there are, quote, investigations at other levels, end quote, into Erickson, but wouldn't comment any further. And as for the race, one source tells us those cars were actually going over 200 miles per hour. Today, Ferrari contacted investigators saying the Enzo has an onboard computer that may confirm that. The maximum sentence, Ericsson, 44, can be sentenced to for the stolen cars, drunk driving and weapons offenses, is 14 years in prison. It remains to be seen how it goes for Chuck Steff. In mid-2009, Ericsson would receive a guilty verdict. He would be sentenced to three years in prison, plus three years probation. But because of the time he's already served, as well as other allowances, he should be free in about a year. Once he gives up his orange jumpsuit, Erickson faces immediate deportation from the U.S., although his lawyer has stated that the now houseless and carless felon was planning to leave anyway. Erickson would find himself in prison again shortly after return to Sweden, this time for being convicted for pouring gasoline on the man who allegedly owed him money. However, he would not be the only former Gizmondo exec facing legal troubles. Carl Freer, a prominent European high-tech executive, was arrested Wednesday at his Bel Air estate on suspicion of posing as a police officer to buy at least one gun, widening an international investigation that began with the crash of a rare Ferrari in Malibu. Freer, 35, allegedly flashed a badge from an obscure San Gabriel Valley Transit Authority and said he was a sworn police officer so that he could purchase a gun from a dealer without the required background checks, authorities said. Freer was released soon afterwards. Now, let's quickly talk about the sheer amount of money Freer and Erickson each made from working at Tiger. According to a dive from the Sunday Times, in March 2004, Freer set his basic pay from the company at £500,000, around US$650,000. But by the end of the year, combined with bonuses, Freer and Erickson had each made over a million pounds, with benefits including a £5,000 a month car allowance. The suspicion from authorities here is understandable, especially as, according to that same article, Freer and Ericsson were also involved with another company called Asiatic Bank and Finance based in Panama. Notably, this is a company for which no major financial records could be found. On top of that, the Gizmodo execs had partaken in account layering. Even by 2008, liquidators in the UK were unable to account for nearly half of all the money that those at Tiger had spent. Despite everything, perhaps there really was at least some heart and vision behind the Gizmondo, even if it seemed to lose that in development and have its short life obscured by controversy. In some ways, the Gizmondo really could be seen as ahead of its time. An app store, GPS functions, even for better or worse, ads and games. Yet, at the same time, even if the controversies surrounding it weren't so heavily publicized, the Gizmondo would still likely be a barely remembered flop. It's unlikely a new handheld system from a smaller company would have ever been able to compete with the juggernauts that were Nintendo and Sony. Freer believes that this chain of events, which ultimately gave Gizmondo the dubious distinction of being the least successful handheld gaming system in history, has obscured the vision and hard work that Tiger Telematics invested in the product. It's a slap in the face to anyone who spent time working on it to hear comments like that, he said. Unfortunately, some of the more colorful stories, particularly about Stefan and what happened in Malibu, were true. That's fueled the scandalous element. For those of us who put a lot of time into it, it's a sad ending. Despite the fact that it could take pictures, store music and video, send and receive emails, and came packaged with a fully functional GPS, no console crash has been more sadly amusing than the Gizmondo, making it more than qualified to be the worst console of all time.
I feel like I should say something big and profound since this is both the Art of Failure series finale and the Stuff We Play YouTube channel finale. Uh, but after working on this for over a year and some at this point, and just going over all the details of the story, what else is there to say than just, damn, 